Hi, I'm Brynn with Teach English in Rome. I'm very happy to be chatting today with Tiffany Elizabeth. She has a very interesting story of how she made the switch from living in Seattle to living in Rome. And she did so because she wanted to have a better work-life balance. Hi, Tiffany. I'm so excited to be chatting with you today. Hi, Brynn. It's really good to see you again. And when we first met, I was really interested in your story of how you got started teaching English in Rome. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I think my journey into teaching English is not unique. I think it follows the trajectory of a lot of people who pursue teaching English as a foreign language. Um, I never imagined myself as a teacher growing up. This wasn't a career I saw myself going into. Um, however, I ended up, I was working a good job. I was making a lot of money in Seattle a couple of years ago, and I was using that flexibility provided in that job to travel a lot. and. The whole time I was working this job, I never really felt challenged intellectually. Um, and I didn't feel like I was, you know, fulfilling the potential that I saw in myself and is something that I could pursue. So I thought that answers would come to me with a big move. And I quit my job. I moved over to Europe with the other Part of that being that I'm a British citizen and I needed to establish residency in Europe and choose a European country before Brexit went through. And this was back when the original Brexit deadline was 2018, 2018, pretty sure it was 2018. Um, so there were a lot of factors coming together. I ended up landing in Europe, um, Europe generally as a continent. So I started off in Lyon, going back from Lyon, back and forth to Italy. Um, then I went over to Prague for a while, and then I landed in the north of Italy, and then finally found my way down to Rome. Um, I ended up teaching because I was bored, honestly. And I felt that I had no direction. I came over here for a direction, and I couldn't find it. Um, and you know, people kept telling me, Tiffany, why don't you look into teaching English, at least for an amount of time and see if it's something that's interesting to you. Maybe it will open the doors to put some puzzle pieces together and figure out what makes you tick. And turns out I really got passionate about teaching methodology and about helping people face-to-face, um, -face, build, building on my customer service experience, really understanding you know, people and how they work and how to help them grow. And that's what I see in teaching. And so it becomes less about the language and more about the connection with people. And then once you establish that connection, it's so great to see the growth. So I really convoluted answer. That's kind of how I got here. And why I'm staying here. I like how you said that you tried a couple of things out first. Um, it sounds like you traveled around a lot um, when you first got to Europe as the continent. Um, so as you were traveling to the different locations, so um, you said Lyon and, and Prague, um, how short of a time span was that? And what were you doing when you were in those locations at first? So when I landed in Lyon, the plan was originally to move to Paris because I had done my Erasmus in Paris. And um, I ended up visiting Lyon on my way to Paris originally and thinking, oh, this actually looks like a nice place. I think I'll, I think I'll try Lyon. And so I flew back home without an apartment in Lyon. Uh, I decided that I was going to bring all my stuff. So I landed back in Lyon at a hotel after two weeks in Seattle with um, three or four massive suitcases, plus a big backpack, my yoga mat, everything. I was completely committed to the move. No job, no apartment, no friends. Just thought this is going to work. 
very optimistic. Um, so I ended up moving between Airbnbs in Lyon for about three months. Very difficult with a lot of stuff. So um, during this time, I wasn't working. I was living off of savings and I was thinking about what I wanted to do. And I ended up getting progressively more and more sedentary by not having something to do. I thought that I wanted this vacation from work and I found myself with no direction. Um, so I was looking into possibly going to graduate school in Europe, but I didn't know for what. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go to graduate school if you don't know what you're going for. So a lot of people around me suggested looking into TEFL and using that as a way to buy myself some time. So originally I started off by doing an online TEFL course. I found on Groupon. I think it cost five dollars. <laughs> it was less than perfect, but it did show me that this idea of teaching English was something that I was really interested in. Um, and I actually finished the course. It was a 120 hour course. I finished it in less than four days. And then I promptly found out that um, I wanted to do something that felt a little bit more legitimate. So something maybe in person. So I sought out one of the Cambridge programs, one of the CELTA programs. And I saw that there was one starting the next week in Prague. And they had, I emailed them quickly. They had one space left. And so I sent an application, did an interview the day after I finished the online TEFL course, got accepted, booked a train to bring all my suitcases to my boyfriends in Italy, and booked a plane from Rome to Prague, thinking, well, it'll at least give me something to do for a while. Um, and yeah, really fell in love with teaching. I'm so happy for you that you found something that you really like to do um, because I can identify with the um, pivoting and trying things out just to see, um, not, not just to see, but in order to see how they work for you. Um, and I think that a lot of people come to teaching after having done something else. So I wonder, what do you think um, it is about teaching and what your specific experiences have been that you can see that the skills that you've developed in the past transfer over to teaching as well? Sure. I think there are several things that I find in teaching that make it fulfilling for me. Um, I come from a performing arts and a customer service background. Um, with teaching, um, being able to relate to people very authentically and um, be a very empathetic person and to always appear genuine and fun and upbeat. These things are really crucial in my opinion because when somebody's learning a foreign language, they usually feel very uncomfortable, very unsure of themselves. So being able to learn how to connect with them in an authentic, genuine way, even if they have a very low level of English is crucial. And I strongly believe that my performing arts background and my customer service background have fed into my ability to excel at this. And I, I can totally understand that because whenever you're dealing with a, um, any kind of situation where you're growing a relationship with a person, if you know how to relate with them um, and you demonstrate empathy when you're talking to them, then you can grow a lot stronger relationship. Um, and in my own experience with learning languages, when I work with private teachers, a lot of times it will be me liking the teacher so much, not mm -hmm. so much the learning of the language, but I like the teacher so much and that keeps me going. Um, and that keeps me achieving my goals, um, but then also keeps me going to the lessons. <laughs> Definitely, and doing the homework and being encouraging and just, um, you know, I am very hands on with my students, with all my private students, you know, I'm talking to them several times per week, just checking in, even when we don't have lessons, is I like to maintain the constant line of communication. 
Um, and yes, it does take time out of my day, but I think it's endlessly valuable for the students. So sending them funny YouTube videos that I think they might enjoy. So they practice listening or, you know, I've got a student who's a chef. So I send him cooking videos in English almost every day. Um, and it just makes sure that he is doing something in English every day, reminding that I'm here with him on his journey, that I support him every step of the way. And I think that's something that you don't find a lot, especially in the private language schools. So it's something that working privately that I'm really making an effort to incorporate into my programs. Mm. So um, I know that you've now been working as an English teacher for a while. Um, and when we've chatted before, you've talked to me about your experiences in different schools working in Rome. So can you tell me um, in general terms, how is it that you were able to find a school that you feel comfortable working in? And um, are there any kind of um, signals that you look for when you're first talking to um, say the directors of the school to figure out if it would actually be a good place for you to work? Definitely. So these are very loaded questions. Um, my first school in Italy was very chaotic. Um, maybe not the most professionally run. In fact, five of the seven teachers left within a month. Okay, I was one of them. Uh, with a big part of the problem being the lack of professionalism. Um, I've always been very interested in business. Another thing I like about the TEFL world is that there's a lot of opportunities to build your own businesses. So this was something that attracted to me as me to teaching as well. Um, so you do kind of want to be treated as a professional when you're a teacher. Otherwise it's very demeaning. And unfortunately, it also affects the quality of your lessons. Um, you know, and I say that honestly, it, my lessons suffered significantly when I didn't feel treated as a professional or respected. And uh, so that was something that when I moved to Rome, um, you know, almost a year and a half now, um, that was probably the single most important thing was that I went into the interview with a school feeling that there was a professional environment with a respect for their teachers as professionals, a respect for their time, a respect for their knowledge, and a general understanding that they have needs too, that we're not just, you know, at the beck and call of the school. Um, and, and so I wonder, is there anything that you could figure out um, when you, before you started working at the school, like, what told you that it would be a school that would be respectful of you as a professional? Sure, I think there are a lot of small, subtle things to be on the lookout for. Um, being honest about salary, about holidays, whether you know Christmas breaks are paid or unpaid, they just, you need to make sure that when you ask these questions that you get a definite answer. And it's not sort of, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and no for sure um, confident answer to your questions. Um, you also, if possible, should ask for the opportunity to speak with a current teacher without the person who's interviewing um, in the same room. So, um, you know, when I was making my decision, I interviewed with about 20 different schools in Rome and I had offers from each of them. Um, and something that I needed to do to figure out which of these schools I would go with, I asked if I could speak to a current employee um, to know, you know, what are their frustrations with the school because no workplace is perfect. So wherever you work, there are going to be things that you don't like. So I wanted to see if the things they didn't like, if that was a problem for me. Um, 
because a lot of people will feed you language about what's the best thing about working here. And a lot of it sounds the same. So if you can really dig into, okay, what are the problems here? That's important. Um, you know, it's easy to cut out schools when you find reviews on Google or through Glassdoor or hopefully teaching English in Rome uh, soon where you figure out that teachers aren't paid or teachers aren't paid reliably or on time or that teachers are expected to run around all corners of Rome with public transportation and are not paid for that time. These are signs of unprofessional uh, treatment of teachers. So it's going into interviews with respect for yourself and respect for your time and respect for yourself as a professional. I like how you ask to be connected with teachers that are currently teaching at the school without the administration present. Um, so were you able to get those conversations when you just flat out ask whomever you're speaking with in the interview, you were able to get those conversations? I think I talked to, um, actually, no, I didn't get to talk to uh, current teachers at every school. Okay. Uh, some schools didn't like that question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think I talked to three, maybe four current teachers. So that went from my decision being between 20 schools mm -hmm. to between three and four. Mm -hmm. So that's that was a, a very easy way to cut it down. Yeah, that's a really good strategy. Um, so one thing that I have been doing for a number of years is using LinkedIn to find people that work at the place that I am thinking of working and asking them um, to get on a quick call and ask them about what their experience is. And it's interesting that a lot of times, and it might be not so many, but I just remember very loudly in my mind, the instances where people told me not to work where they work because it wasn't a place that I, I seemed like I would be happy in if I am a ambitious and creative person. But um, you can't always find the people that are working at the schools. Um, and I've also found that a lot of times teachers aren't on LinkedIn a lot. Um, so flat out asking the administration and then seeing how they respond, that can tell you a lot. So I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. And I think also a lot of teachers don't one aren't on LinkedIn, but then a lot of teachers are also discouraged not to put um, which school they work at on their Facebook profile or on their LinkedIn profile, because that can be a way for the students from the school to contact their teachers outside of school, which is usually something that the schools discourage. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Um, and so this leads to another question that I have been um, not so much asking flat out to a lot of teachers in Rome, but the conversation goes there, is what is the situation with balancing um, working at a school and taking on private clients? Um, do you find that you can just work at the school or do you have to take on, do you feel like you um, have to take on private clients as well? So I very happily worked at the school um, for several months without private students. Um, I'm very fortunate to be in a situation where I don't pay rent. So for me, I was able to live very comfortably off of my school salary. And I will be honest, the school that I work for, they pay very well in comparison to a lot of the schools in Rome. Um, that was something I was looking for. But anyways, um, at a lot of the schools, the salaries are quite low. So it's going to sound very low if you have an American audience, but the norm in Rome can be for first year teachers from 1,100 euros to 1,300 euros after taxes. Now, if you are living in your own flat, you are looking at paying probably a bare minimum in a really not so great place, 700 euros. A month. Then you add on groceries, you add on your cell phone bill, you add on your transport pass, etc. You're not left with anything. There's no saving happening. And you might actually be paying money to live this life. Um, 
so then you have to make the decision if you're going to live with other people, you know, um, have roommates. So for this reason, I think a lot of teachers, especially teachers who are um, maybe, you know, a little bit older than the crowd that generally starts out. So uh, mid twenties and up, you're going to want to be taking on private students as soon as possible to be able to afford the cost of living in Rome. That's, that's something that um, I have thought about quite a bit as well. Um, so one of my sob stories um, that I tell people is that after I had originally started my teaching career in Rome, um, I couldn't afford to, um, to continue staying in Rome and I didn't know how to effectively get private clients and manage my own um, manage my my own school schedule as well it, it just seemed very complicated for me at the age that I was back then um, so I moved back to the states and I got a lot more experience teaching um, I became a lot more confident in what I could um, in, in the in the level of achievement I could get from my students. And then I became a teacher leader and a teacher trainer. And then I learned I was eligible for Italian citizenship. I looked to move back to Rome. I interviewed for a school. And with all my experience and training, they said, we'll offer you 12 euros an hour. <laughs> and I thought, I asked why. And they said, because you've never taught here before. Mm -hmm. um, so that led to me wanting to talk to more teachers in Rome and um, know what the situation is and, and what the real story is. Um, so thanks to Teach English in Rome, I've now talked to a lot of other um, English teachers like you that work in other schools, but then have been able to find a place where you're happy teaching. And then also I've talked to people who have started their own business. Um, and they have been able to niche their business <clears throat> to be able to meet a market where they can comfortably live in Rome. Um, so yeah, the, the stories that you are referring to um, and not explicitly telling you, I have personal experience with that. <laughs> um, I think, so this leads to another question, is I think mm -hmm. that um, when you move to Italy, um, you've told me, like other people have, have told me, and like I did myself, you're looking for more of a work-life balance and not, um, as I find happens in the US a lot, is work, 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 and then you retire and, well, you're, you're not living the kind of life that you dreamed of when you were um, started out your career. So what would you say that the work-life balance looks like now for you? Sure. I think, you know, I moved to Rome perhaps with a little, or to Europe in general with rose-colored glasses, thinking that the American style of living was something very strange still in Rome and in Italy in general. I have found that's not so much the case. I think the American attitude towards work is found perhaps to a slightly lesser extent here. It is happening, especially in the younger crowd. Because youth unemployment is so high, young people, young graduates who are able to find a job are expected to work very long hours, um, leading to a lot of unhappiness within the young part of the population in Italy. And this is why we see so many articles, you know, I think there was one on NPR last year about why so many of it, um, Italy's young population is leaving. Why are they leaving Italy for other countries? Well, because they can't make good money with very long work hours and the work-life balance is not what it used to be. That being said, in English teaching, there still is a work-life balance in Rome. So <laughs> your students may not have it, but I think you are very capable of finding one for yourself here. I think the keys are 
not having split shifts, um, limiting yourself to uh, what you personally define as a work-life balance. So for me, working six hours per day at the private school, six days per week, um, that's already quite a bit, 36 hours per week. Mm. But I can handle, um, you know, I can handle, I don't know, five private students maybe when I'm teaching full time um, without that impeding my sense of enjoyment of life. You know, usually working at the school I work at now, we work from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. or you work from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So if you work from 2 to 8 p.m., you have the whole morning free. I go for a nice like two or three hour long walks through the center of the city, cook myself a leisurely lunch with produce from the market and fresh eggs, and really I'm grateful for where I live and the quality of the food and the quality of the light. Rome is famous for the color of the sky and it's really beautiful to have the time to enjoy that with a long walk every day. So if I say I want four hours for myself in the morning, okay, then I would have to wake up at 10 a.m. I wake up a lot earlier than that. So if I wake up at 6.30 a.m., then in theory, I've got time for a couple of students that day. I think that's a really good point. Um, so you started out answering what I know that you can read about in the newspapers. And then if I talk to um, possibly a younger Italian that um, is a little bit more pessimistic about the future, um, they'll tell me how high the youth unemployment is. But then um, what I heard you ending the conversation or ending the answer with is um, you can decide what you want to focus on yourself. Um, so you can decide to focus on um, the beauty of the light in Rome or, um, or the fact that you can go to an open air market um, before you go to work, which is something that um, after I moved back to the US from Rome, I was aching for those open air markets. Um, I, and you just, they, they don't exist here like they do there. Um, and that's something that I think is important to, um, to look at what you do have when you move to a new country looking for a work-life balance. Um, you can find the snippets of what you're looking for um, amidst the, um, the life that you're still having when you're, when you're still having to work and you're not able to be on a um, eternal vacation. Definitely. And you know, now that I've been in Europe for several years, um, I see now that I didn't need perhaps to move to Europe to find a work-life balance. I think it's all about how you approach life and about what you prioritize each day and how you find that balance because 24 hours a day is not really enough time for anybody. So it's, it's about finding what you need and what your personal balance is. And I'm sorry, but if you think that moving to Europe is going to solve all of your dissatisfactions, that is not always the case. Um, for me, it turned out really well, but I think it's about just finding what you enjoy in life and incorporating that into your life, whether that is moving abroad or teaching English abroad, or if you won't decide that that's not the move for you and you want to stay um, back home, it's finding what you need in life wherever you are. I really like how you're reminding um, people of that. And I read, oh, what is that book? The, Al the Alchemist by Paolo, Paolo Coelho. Um, have you read that? It's been a really long time, I think, yeah. since high school. Yeah, so I read it after college, and I liked how um, the main character went on this journey basically around the world, if I remember it correctly, um, to find what he was looking for all along, and it was basically where he'd started. Um, and I think that <clears throat> people go in search of finding... Um, some kind of internal um, satisfaction. So they go looking outward for it um, when they can actually um, find it within themselves. 
Um, so I, I really like how you reminded people of that. Yeah, I think, look, if you're always focusing on, you know, grass is greener on the other side approach, um, Europe's not going to make you any happier than being back in America made you. And for a while, I struggled with that. I thought about the things that I missed back home and, oh, life is so much more convenient. Bureaucracy doesn't take me, you know, five trips of going to the city hall to get one document sorted out and then waiting there for half an hour for the lady to remember her password to log into the computer. Okay. But if you choose not to focus on that and you cho choose to focus on the color of the sky, on the markets in every neighborhood, the fact that I can do my daily run through the forum and then through the city center, the historic center of Rome, and then through Trastevere and then back to my house, stopping at the market. These are the things to appreciate and you can find those enjoyments in life back home too. So, you know, yeah. it's not a magic cure-all to move abroad. I, I really like how you threw in that you're um, going through a jog in the morning uh, past the Roman Forum and past the Colosseum. Um, that's something that you can't do um, just any time. <laughs> that's true. That's, um, a, that's definitely an advantage to living in Rome. I have yeah. to admit. Yeah. Um, well, if you think of somebody that is already teaching English and wants to um, make their way to kind of a happy situation of teaching English, what recommendations would you, would you give them based on your experience? Sure. I think you have to be honest with yourself. I think you need to take a step back, look at your situation, maybe do a pros and cons list. And then also thinking about why are these pros for me? Why are these cons for me? What am I getting at? What is the reason why I am happy with this factor or unhappy with this factor? And really doing a strong self-evaluation. Um, as I've been pivoting in this sphere a bit, I've had to do a lot of work on myself and identifying, you know, what is valuable to me and what things maybe aren't so important to me. And that's helping me develop my niche as a teacher and as a, you know, somebody who's pursuing their own private clients as well. Um, and finding the passion in the work. It's all about knowing yourself and harnessing your own interests to become successful, quote unquote. That's a really good point. And I, I agree with you that it's so important to look at why you feel the way you do about certain things. Um, in order to make your decisions on what will happen next. So one last question that I like to ask everybody is looking back on your experiences teaching English in Rome, is there anything that you wish that you would have done differently? Sure. Um, so I kind of touched on this in the blog post as well. Um, Perhaps the only thing that I regret looking back, because generally I'm very grateful for the journey that I've had, but I think I should have included questions in when I was interviewing school, for schools um, to find out what professional development opportunities were. And this is a question that is standard in most interview environments in business engineers, every other job interviews, that's a standard question to ask is, what opportunities for professional development do you provide? And what sort of upward mobility is there in the company? That question is not the norm in the English language teaching atmosphere. So I should have incorporated something to get that information. Mm, that's a really good point. But I, I think any time that you look back on a situation, there's always room for improvement. Mm -hmm. And um, well, and then in teacher talk, that's where the growth happens. Um, so you have opportunities to pursue um, that great idea that you could have done. You have opportunities to pursue that in the future. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany, for taking the time to chat with me. And um, I really wish you the best of luck in everything that you're doing. Thank you, Bryn. You too. I can't wait to see what Teach English in Rome uh, develops into over the next few months. It's such a great project. Oh, thank you so much.